Welcome, my friend. It's good to see you. Please sit, grab a drink, and listen to the tale of Havelock the Dane. Once in the distant past, England was ruled by a noble and benevolent king named Athelwald. However, fate had dealt him a cruel blow as he fell gravely ill and realised that his time on earth was coming to an end. With his wife already deceased, his sole concern was his baby daughter, who was not yet able to speak or walk. Athelwald pondered with great concern. Who will safeguard and guide my daughter until she is ready to take the reins of England? Summoning all his barons and earls from across the land, from Roxburgh to Dover, Athelwald posed a crucial question to them. Who would be the most capable guardian for his daughter Goldborough? The response was unanimous. Earl Godrich of Cornwall was known to be a noble and trustworthy man who could be entrusted with the care of Goldborough until she reached the age to ascend the throne. In a solemn ceremony, Athelwald made Earl Godrich swear upon the Bible that he would protect and nurture Goldborough until she was ready to marry. Furthermore, he extracted a promise from Godrich that he would find the tallest, most handsome and strongest suitor for Goldborough and hand over the kingdom to her. Earl Godrich, aware of the gravity of his oath, swore to fulfil these duties faithfully. Sadly, shortly after Athelwald's passing, Earl Godrich ascended to power and seized control over the entire kingdom. He cunningly stationed loyal knights within the castles, causing the entire realm of England to tremble in fear and submission. Earl Godrich became a despotic ruler, feared by all like a tyrant who whips a cowering beast. Meanwhile, the young Princess Goldborough blossomed into a wise and beautiful maiden. As rumours of her grace and intelligence reached Earl Godrich's ears, an envious sigh escaped his lips, and he mused, Why should Goldborough be the queen and hold authority over me? I have a handsome son who should be the rightful king of England. Driven by ambition and consumed by jealousy, Earl Godrich conveniently forgot the sacred vow he had made. He summoned Goldborough and callously imprisoned her in the bleak confines of Dover Castle, situated on the windswept shores. Stripped of her finery, she languished in solitude, denied the comforts of her friends and loved ones. Leaving Goldborough's predicament for a moment, let us journey to Denmark, a land ruled by a powerful and affluent king named Birkebane. However, even his wealth and influence could not stave off illness and he found himself on his deathbed. With his last breaths, King Birkebane beseeched his loyal friend Goddard to pledge an oath to protect and care for his son and two daughters until his son Havelock could wield a sword and rightfully claim the Danish throne. Goddard, though he had made the promise, proved to be a treacherous villain. Instead of providing a safe haven, he callously imprisoned the children in a desolate tower where they endured hunger and bitter cold. Driven by wicked intentions, Goddard hatched a nefarious scheme. He rode to the tower, drawing his knife with evil intent. His sinister plan was to eliminate the defenceless Havelock, as he had already done with the king's two innocent daughters. However, before Goddard could carry out this act of unspeakable cruelty, Havelock, in a last-ditch effort, fell to his knees and implored, I beg you, my lord, have mercy upon me, spare my life and I will leave Denmark forever, never to return again. The malevolence within Goddard's heart wavered momentarily at Havelock's plea. While he wished for Havelock's demise, he hesitated to be the one to spill his blood. If I let him live, he could pose a significant threat, Goddard thought. But if he were dead, my children could inherit the throne and rule Denmark after me. Thus Goddard devised a sinister plan, summoning a fisherman by the name of Grimm. Promising him a grand reward, he commanded Grimm to take Havelock and drown him in the vast sea. Bound tightly with a sturdy rope and concealed within a solid black bag, Havelock was entrusted to Grimm's care and brought to the fisherman's humble abode. In the dead of night, Grimm rose from his bed and dressed, preparing to carry out the heinous act. 
Turning to his wife, Dame Leave, he commanded, Go, stoke the fire, and light the candle. I shall take the boy to the sea and drown him there. Leave obediently carried out her instructions, but as she did so, she saw Havelock bound on the floor, bathed in a radiant light that illuminated the surroundings as if it were daylight, and from his mouth emanated a beam of light resembling a sunbeam. Perplexed, Leave exclaimed, What could this mean? Grim, rise and witness this extraordinary light. Grim and Leave rushed to Havelock's side, swiftly untying his ropes. To their astonishment, they discovered a royal birthmark on his right shoulder. Ah! exclaimed Grim, this child shall one day be king of Denmark and England. Grim knelt before Havelock, pleading, Lord, have mercy on us both. My wife and I will care for you and serve you until you are old enough to wield a sword. Havelock was overjoyed by these words. I am famished, he admitted. Then, my lord, I shall bring you bread, cheese, butter, milk, pastries and cakes, Leave assured him. She promptly fetched the food, and Havelock devoured it eagerly, his spirits uplifted. The following day, Grimm started contemplating their situation. If Goddard discovers that this boy is alive, he mused, he will have us hanged. We should flee from the land. Grimm sold all his possessions, corn, sheep, cattle, horses, swine, goats, geese and hens in the yard. He coated his ship with tar, sealing its seams with pitch, and accompanied by Havelock, Leave and their three sons and two daughters, they set sail. Just a mile from the shore, a strong north wind propelled them towards England. They landed near the river Humber, in a place now known as Grimsby. There Grim constructed a humble cottage for his family. Grim sustained his livelihood by fishing, employing nets and hooks. He captured a variety of fish from the sea, and fashioned baskets for himself and his sons, enabling them to transport the fish inland for sale. Frequently he journeyed to the thriving town of Lincoln with his catch. Upon returning he rejoiced, for he brought back cakes, sacks filled with meal and corn, meat, hemp for crafting lines and ropes for nets. For twelve winters Grimm managed to provide a comfortable life. Meanwhile Havelock recognised that Grimm toiled diligently while he remained at home. I'm no longer a child, he declared one day. I can consume more than Grimm and his five children combined. Tomorrow I will venture out with a basket on my back and earn my own sustenance. The next day Havelock embarked with a basket brimming with fish. His load equalled that of four ordinary men. He sold the fish lucratively and returned home with money. Thus he continued his daily excursions. However, a severe famine descended upon the land, leaving Grimm perplexed about feeding his family. Concerning his own sons, he scarcely gave them a thought, focusing solely on Havelock. Thus he spoke to him earnestly. Havelock, my dear son, this famine is so dire that we may perish from hunger. It would be wise for you to seek sustenance elsewhere. Head to Lincoln, a city you know well, but first I will fashion a cloak for you out of my sail to protect you from the cold. Grim cut his sail, fashioning a cloak for Havelock. The young boy donned the cloak and set off for Lincoln barefoot. For two long days Havelock had suffered in hunger and desperation, unable to find any work to sustain himself. But fate had a surprise in store for him on the third day. A distant cry echoed through the streets. Porters! Porters are needed here! It was Earl Godrich's esteemed cook, Bertram, seeking someone to carry the meat he had purchased at the bridge all the way to the castle. Havelock saw his chance and boldly manoeuvred through the crowd, surpassing nine or ten other boys, and took up the task. The cook was impressed by the young lad's strength and rewarded him with a delicious cake. Encouraged by his small triumph, Havelock eagerly awaited the cook's next venture to the bridge. This time Bertram had an abundant load of fish waiting to be transported. Again he called out, Porters! Porters! Sixteen lads stood in Havelock's path 
but his determination knew no bounds. He skillfully made his way through, directly to the cook's side, and shouldered an impressive variety of fish. The cook was taken aback by Havelock's prowess, and offered him an opportunity to stay and work at the castle. With a heart full of hope, Havelock agreed, asking only for enough food to sustain him. In return, he promised to be a dedicated helper, taking care of various tasks such as fetching water, tending the fire, gathering wood, and even cleaning dishes. Thus, Havelock began his new life at the castle. His unyielding dedication and infectious cheerfulness won the affection of everyone around him, from knights to children, young and old alike. Word spread far and wide about his towering height, impressive strength and striking handsomeness. In his new-found clothes, gifted by Bertram, he appeared like a true king or emperor, especially when he attended sporting events in Lincoln, where he stood head and shoulders above the rest, reigning as a wrestling champion. As fate would have it, during Parliament's gathering in town, various champions from far and wide arrived to showcase their strengths in games. Among the challenges was a daunting task of lifting and throwing an enormous stone, as heavy as an ox. Many tried and failed, but when Bertram encouraged Havelock to try, he dared not refuse. With a single throw, Havelock astonished the crowd, launching the stone far beyond anyone's expectations. His feet quickly became the talk of the kingdom, and even Earl Godrich, the ruler of England, took notice. Realising the potential for this extraordinary boy, Godrich devised a cunning plan to secure his own power and legacy for his son. In the shadowy depths of his cunning mind, Godrich spun a sinister web, weaving a plot to claim England for himself and his son. He schemed, contemplating the destiny of two young souls entangled in his devious machinations. Havelock shall wed Goldborough, he mused his thoughts veering towards a pledge he had given to King Athelwold. He had sworn to bestow the fair maiden upon the most towering, robust and handsome man he could find. In Godrich's eyes, Havelock was but a poor boy, and he saw an opportunity to exploit this perception. If Goldborough were to marry a lonely servant, she would never ascend to the throne as the Queen of England. But little did he know that the universe had a reckoning in store for him as justice often finds its way. Summoning Goldborough to Lincoln, Godrich feigned an air of cordiality as the bells of the church rang in hollow celebration. Yet deceit and treachery lurked within the depths of his heart. He spun his tale, claiming that he had found a most handsome suitor for her hand in marriage, but the spirited Goldborough was not so easily beguiled. I shall wed no man, she declared resolutely, be he handsome or not, unless he is a king or a king's son. Mocking her aspirations, Godrich sneered, You dream of being a queen over me? Then prepare to marry a lowly servant, the helper of my cook. The next day, Havelock was summoned before the cunning manipulator. With an air of apparent nonchalance, Godrich broached the topic of marriage to the young lad. Nay, replied Havelock, unaffected by the allure of matrimony. What use would I have for a wife? I lack the means to clothe or feed her. I possess neither house nor cottage, merely an old white cloak. And even these clothes were bestowed upon me by the cook, my master. However, despite Goldborough's tears and Havelock's unwillingness, the relentless threats of Godrich left them with no choice but to succumb to his malevolent will. Thus they were wedded, a union tainted by deceit and coercion. Faced with the malice that emanated from Godrich's very being, Havelock harboured grave concerns for the safety of both himself and his new bride. Fearful of the harm that might befall them, he resolved to take Goldborough away from the clutches of treachery and back to the humble abode of Grim the Fisherman. As he arrived at his destination, he received a heartbreaking revelation. Grim, the man who had accompanied him on his travels, had passed away. However, amidst the sorrow, a ray of hope shone through, for Grim's five children were alive and well, and they warmly welcomed Havelock and his wife Goldborough into their midst, embracing them with open arms. 
Avlock and Goldborough found themselves surrounded by abundance. Houses, cattle, ships and a treasure trove of gold and silver, all left behind by Grimm. Even sheep and swine grazed in their domain and the children offered to share everything they possessed with their new guests. Despite the joyous reception, Goldborough couldn't escape a lingering sadness, for she felt she had married beneath her station to a mere servant lad. However, fate had grander plans in store for them. One fateful night as Goldborough lay beside Havelock, a radiant light emanated from her husband's mouth akin to a blazing fire. Astonishingly, she noticed a royal birthmark in the shape of a cross on his shoulder, but that wasn't all. A celestial voice whispered to her, revealing Havelock's true identity as a king's son and heir. The prophecy declared that he would one day ascend the thrones of both Denmark and England. This divine revelation filled Goldborough with joy and hope for their future. When Havelock awoke and recounted his dream of holding Denmark and England within his grasp, Goldborough shared the revelation with him. Now more determined than ever to fulfil their destiny, she urged him to return to Denmark, where he would rightfully reign as king. Havelock agreed, and they decided to set sail without delay, accompanied by Grimm's brave and loyal sons, Robert the Red, William and Hugh Raven. Upon reaching Denmark, they sought refuge with a powerful earl named Oob, who had been a friend of Havelock's father. Havelock humbly asked Oob for the chance to make a living through trade, which a generous earl granted. However, Oob couldn't help but marvel at Havelock's imposing presence and noble demeanour, sensing that this man was meant for greater things. As fate would have it, during a lavish feast at Oob's castle, the guests marvelled at Goldborough's beauty, and Oob grew concerned that their presence might attract unsavoury attention. To safeguard them, he sent Havelock, Goldborough, and Grimm's sons to stay with his trustworthy friend, Bernard. But destiny's twists and turns were just beginning to unfold. That very night, sixty ruthless thieves besieged Bernard's house, brandishing knives and swords, demanding entry with menace in their voices and they threw a great stone against the door and broke it. Havelock saw this. He went to the door, pulled out the huge bar, and cast the door wide open. Come on, he cried. I am ready for you. The thieves rushed at Havelock. He heaved up the bar of the door, and at one blow slew three of them. He clapped the fourth in the crown and gave the fifth a dimp between the shoulders that sent him flying. The six tried to run away, but Havelock struck him in the neck with the bar and felled him to the earth. The seventh drew his sword, but Havelock smote him in the chest and killed him. Then the thieves took counsel together and agreed to surround Havelock. They drew out swords and rushed at him as dogs do at a savage bear. Some attacked him with wood, some with stones, some wounded him with their swords. Havelock laid about him furiously with the bar while the blood ran from his wounds. In a short time he had felled twenty men to the ground. Hugh Raven heard the terrible din. He took an oar and a long knife and went to the place, and there he saw the thieves beating on Havelock as a smith beats on an anvil with his hammer. Robert, William, he cried, come quickly and help me drive these dogs away. Robert gripped a staff, William a great piece of wood. Bernard came with an axe, and after a fierce fight by the light of the moon, every one of the sixty thieves was killed. The next morning news of the fight came to Oob. Oob rode straight to Bernard's house, and Bernard told him how the thieves came and how Havelock had fought them. That one man is worth a thousand men, said Bernard, but he is badly wounded. Then Oob took Havelock and his wife Goldborough to a room high up in a tower, he said that they could stay there until Havelock's wounds were healed. Oob's own room was next to the place where Havelock was. There was only a wall of firwood between them, and the first night Havelock stayed there, Oob woke up in the middle of the night. He saw a great light coming from the room where Havelock lay, a light as bright as daylight. Is Havelock revelling and drinking, he said. I'd better go and see. Oob went and peeped through a chink in the wall. He saw Havelock fast asleep beside Goldborough, and from his mouth came a shaft of light. 
What does this mean? thought Oob. He called his knights and bade them look. There was a gleam of light coming from Havelock's mouth like a sunbeam, and there on Havelock's right shoulder, brighter than gold, was a cross which showed that he was a king. And they guessed that he was Birkabane's son, for he was as like Birkabane as a brother. Now Havelock woke, and Oob and his knights fell on their knees and did him homage. You are very young, my lord, said Oob, but you shall be king of Denmark. The next day, Oob summoned earls and barons, clerks and knights, townspeople and country people with their children and their wives. He told them how Goddard had treated Birkabane's children, and how Grimm had rescued Havelock and taken him to England. And now here stand your lord, he said. Do him homage, all of you. I shall be the first. And once more Oob knelt down before Havelock and swore to serve him. In the weeks that followed, men came from all over Denmark to swear loyalty to Havelock, and Oob dubbed him a knight, and he was made King of Denmark. Ah, but there was great joy then. There was wrestling and throwing of the stone, and thrusting with sharp spears, and harping and piping and singing and dinging on the drum. There was baiting of bulls and boars, there was feasting, there was drinking. Grimm's sons, Robert the Red and William and Hugh Raven, were made barons and given land. And when the feasting was over, Havelock sent a party of his knights out to find Goddard and bring him bound before him. They made their way to a path along which Goddard often rode to go hunting. Robert the Red, who was leading them, was the first to meet Goddard. "'Beware, fellow,' he cried. "'You are to come with me to the king and be punished for your wicked deeds.' There followed a fight between Havelock's followers and Goddard's knights. Goddard's knights fled, and Goddard was bound and brought before Havelock. Havelock ordered that his earls and barons and knights and townspeople should judge Goddard, and they condemned him to be hanged. And so died a false and treacherous man. Then Havelock went with a strong army to England. He and Goldborough landed at Grimsby, where Grim had landed years before. When Godrish, the wicked Earl of Cornwall, heard this, he ordered every man who could wield arms to come to him at Lincoln. Now the English dreaded Godrich as a horse dreads a spur, and they came to Lincoln on the appointed day, ready to fight against the Danes. Knights put on their bright coats of mail, placed their high helms on their heads, leapt on their steeds, and rode towards Grimsby. Havelock, with all his army, came against the English. Bravely he laid about him with his sword, and Robert the Red and William, Hugh Raven and Oob, fought fiercely too. There was terrible slaughter on that battlefield. A thousand knights or more were slain on either side. Then Godrich began to attack the Danes like a lion. He felled them to the ground as a scythe cuts down grass, and nobody could stand against the dint of his sword. When Havelock saw this, he came galloping up on his horse, calling loudly, If you yield, Godrich, I will forgive you the wrong you have done, because you are so brave a knight. I will never yield, cried Godrich, and gripping his sword, he hewed at Havelock and cleft his shield. Havelock drew his own sword and smote Godrich to the earth, but Godrich started up and hit Havelock so hard on the shoulder that he cut loose many rings of his coat of mail and wounded him deeply. Then Havelock slashed with his sword and cut off Godrich's right hand. He took him by the neck and had him bound in steel fetters, and he sent him to Goldborough to be cared for until he came to trial. Now the English knew that Goldborough was the rightful heir to the kingdom, and when Havelock had sent six earls to fetch her from Grimsby, her people came to do her homage. Lady, they said, we know well that Athelwald was a king of this land, and that you are his heir. Have mercy on us, and never again will we rise against you. After this, Godrich was tried and condemned to death, and all the English swore that they would be loyal to Havelock. Havelock did not forget the kindness of Bertram, Earl Godrich's cook. He made him Earl of Cornwall instead of Godrich, presented him with all the land that Godrich had held, and gave him one of Grimm's daughters for his wife. Then Havelock went to London to be crowned King of England, 
and for sixty years he ruled England happily with his queen, the fair Goldborough. Now you have heard the story of Havelock the Dane. I hope you found the tale entertaining, and if you did, please subscribe, like, and maybe leave a comment down below. It has been a pleasure as always to sit with you, my friend, and I look forward to speaking with you again very soon.